Ingamana, Ingareo, Ingata Wida Pumanoa, Ro Rakatidama, Tanakoto, Tanakoto, Tanatato Katoa. On behalf of the University of Otago, I would like to warmly welcome you to this inaugural professorial lecture for Professor Jim Cotter. As always, it's fantastic to see staff and students from around the university here this evening and also members of the Dunedin community who use these inaugural professorial lectures as part of their ongoing education. Welcome to each and every one of you. I'd like to give a particularly warm welcome, however, to the special people in Jim's life who have come here to join in the celebration and his promotion. His parents, Marge and Ralph, his brother Doug and Doug's family, his sister Louise and her family, his wife, Kate, and their collective children, Hamish, Charlotte, Lucy, and Grace. And I also understand that a large number of Jim's friends are also here, and I welcome each and every one of you. Now, we're all collectively gathered here, whether we are Jim's colleagues or his family or his friends, to celebrate his promotion to professor. And I can honestly say that Jim has seriously earned this promotion. He's an effective and popular teacher, both in the classroom and in the context of postgraduate supervision. By way of example, I had the great pleasure of awarding Jim the OUSA Supervisor of the Year Award in 2010. And I understand that two of Jim's previous master's students, Monique and Terry, have flown here from the University of Wollongong specifically to be here to support him in his IPL. In addition to his skills as a teacher, um, Jim is also an outstanding researcher. He's an international expert on extreme endurance, and as many of you know, he's an endurance athlete himself. He publishes his work in the best international journals in his field, and when we were consulting on the merits of Jim's promotion, um, one of the referees referred to Jim as someone of global excellence in his particular field. Last, but certainly not least, Jim is an outstanding citizen. He's provided excellent service to the school and to the university more broadly. Jim is someone that I know that I can always count on, including to serve as a graduation speaker, which he will do in December of this year. So Jim, on behalf of the University of Otago, I would like to warmly congratulate you on your very well-deserved promotion to professor. Over the years, I have personally not only valued your teaching skill and your research expertise and your service to the university and the broader community, but I have always valued your extremely positive attitude towards everything that you do. I honestly don't think I have ever seen you without a smile on your face. Namihi nui kiakwe. I will now call on Professor Richard Barker, the Pro Vice Chancellor of Sciences, to tell us just a little bit more about Jim's academic history. Norera, Tanakoto, Tanakoto, Tanatato, Katoa. Tanakoi, Vice Chancellor, Tanakoi, Professor Kota, Tanakoi, Emeritus Professor Booth. Friends and colleagues, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. It is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, Professor Jim Cotter, to give his inaugural professorial lecture at the University of Otago. As indicated by our Vice-Chancellor, Professor Cotter is one of our newer professors at the University of Otago, receiving his well-deserved promotion to the position in February of this year. Born on the west coast into an adventurous family, Professor Cotter combined his long-standing interests in endurance and academic prowess, leading to an undergraduate degree in physiology from the University of Canterbury. He then saw the light and moved south, where he undertook a Bachelor of Physical Education, a BFed, which was then followed by an MFed in cold stress physiology. Some of you will know and some of you won't know that those Otago letters uh, identify Jim as a fetter. And this is an extraordinary, passionate group of individuals who are united by their dedication to the study of physical education at the University of Otago and to ensuring that its traditions and values endure. 
Following his FETA years, Professor Cotter undertook his PhD at the University of Wollongong. Having studied uh, cold stress physiology for his masters, it was inevitable that his PhD would be on heat stress. And on this theme of endurance, that set of qualifications kept Professor Cotter in the books for, I estimate, around 10 years. And tonight we see the reward of that combination of deep-seated interest, talent and endurance in the promotion that we are celebrating. With more than 110 scholarly publications to his name, Professor Cotter is an accomplished scientist, renowned for his expertise in sports physiology. But that is not enough to get you promoted at the University of Otago. To get promoted to professor at Otago is a challenge, and you have to be an all-rounder. And what I'd like to draw attention to is, or really emphasise what the Vice-Chancellor has already identified, which is Jim's dedication to his students. For his undergraduate teaching, he was nominated for Best Lecturer in 2016. That year, he was also one of just five teaching staff at the university who achieved a high number of commendations in the Quality Advancement Unit's Student and Graduate Opinion Survey. He is a sought-after supervisor and has supervised around 17 PhD students and 19 MSc students. And for the high quality of this supervision, he was nominated for Supervisor of the Year in 2003 and 2004 and 2010. And as the Vice-Chancellor just indicated, he took out that award in 2010. At a personal level, Jim is one of the nicest people you could ever meet. And from the standpoint of a pro-vice-chancellor, he is part of the social glue that holds the fabric of the school together. His quiet leadership is enormously important and deeply appreciated, and I would like to publicly thank him for that. Tonight, Jim is going to discuss the interactions between exercise and environment, looking at ultra-endurance in a context of severe stress from heat, cold, hypoxia, and dehydration. Please join me in welcoming Professor Jim Cotter. Tēnākoe te whare, tēnākoutu nohi nei, Kaua te uh, nei e mihi, uh, tēnā koutou, tēnā tūtou. Ki ora tūtou, uh, Vice-Chancellor, Pro-Vice-Chancellor, Emeritus Professor Booth. Thank you very much for um, very generous introductions. Um, at this stage, I better start a timer because I never finish my lectures and <laughs> Oh, this one I'm going to try and do. Um, thank you very much to my family for coming, um, especially from so far, and to Mon and Terry for coming from Wollongong. It's amazing. And everyone else, friends and colleagues who's turned up, um, thank you very much, and for your support, of course, over the time. So we're going to fly through various topics. Um, not going to get into some of the things that interest me physiologically, um, because they probably won't interest you. Um, so we'll just, we'll just go through some things, and it's, it's, it's musing aloud as much as anything. Um, so this is, this is where I'm from, and I, I'm deeply appreciative of my mum and dad and, and family, um, and my family. And I know I'm a professor because they invariably ask me a question, and by the time I get around to answering it, they completely forgot what they asked me. <laughs> and I think that's the hallmark. Um, and, of course, to friends which, um, from, from everywhere. Um, that's me. That's where I come from, and that's, that's me. Um, so our farm, our farm, if I've got a mouse somewhere, our farm was down in here. And this mountain was in front, and this mountain was behind. And of course, we've got quite a lot of rain, like five metres. So I don't actually find that a very extreme environment out there at all. <laughs> um, I was possibly destined to be a scientist 
from a young age because I remember my primary school teacher turning around and yelling at me to shut up. <laughs> um, but it might have had something more to do with the fact we were setting a possuming line up this mountain here. Um, and then on phys ed camp, and the, the lecturer is turning the tables and just asking us why all the time. And if you get that extended period where you've got people asking you why and, and questioning your values, it really is one of those fulcrum points in your life where you, you wonder where you're going and why. Um, in, in being promoted and being acknowledged, I also have to acknowledge we've become a much leaner school. We've lost a, a, a lot of good colleagues from the university, um, and that, that's inevitable. I mean, we had to downsize. Um, but I, I very much appreciate those people, and I acknowledge them. Um, and I, I still wholeheartedly believe that what we represent is physical education, and it has a very strong future. And that's partly what tonight's lecture is about. It's about why, OK, I'm a physiologist, I'm an exercise physiologist, but we operate in a wider context, and I just want to provide those contexts. Um, this is me as well. I mean, the West Coast is too, but this is also me. And I'm just amazing colleagues. Phil Ainsley, in particular, has taught me so much cerebrovascular. And he was Kate's primary supervisor and Luke's. And then I was Sam's primary supervisor, and he was Becky's. And so we've co-supervised so much. And then he was Mickey's as well, and I was Shaunda's. And But we, we interact in our supervision, and I've just learned an enormous amount from Phil. And then co-supervisor on down, and then supervisions and mentors of further PhD students, and now their colleagues. And, and I think the mark of, and something that I truly, truly um, value is the fact that all of these people are smarter than me, and, um, and they're going a lot further than I will. And I, I think that's fantastic. And I also acknowledge um, Gord Sleevet. Um, Gord came and did his uh, research leave with me in Melbourne. And when he left Otago, I came and took his job. But he's no longer with us, unfortunately. He's, he, so he's a true legend. Um, and I acknowledge our facilities. They're amazing. Phys ed school's just got such neat um, and unparalleled uh, facilities for research and teaching and staff. I mean, Nigel is the hero there, just, just a phenomenal character. And the mentors, the scientific mentors in my life are these two in particular, and the other people I work with. So yeah, just we, we integratively study. We study integrative systems. That's what the body is. You know, We teach it as separate items, but it simply doesn't operate that way. Therefore, our questions are necessarily integrative. And of course, so are the people. My, all of these people have more skills in multiple areas than I do. Um, so that, I guess, you know, what are, we're here to talk about exercise and the environment. And this is Joe Donnelly, who many of you all know. And he's clearly to get himself to that kind of nice spot. And you might recognize this mountain here. Um, five and a half thousand metres, he's had to do some exercise to get there. And it's not the easiest environment to do that in. So that's what you see. But what actually characterises that environment? Well, when you exercise and you exercise against gravity, you are undertaking force. So this, for me, now starting to get at what actually is an environment and what's exercise. But it's a lot more than that. It's has some level of oxygen. It has some level of, so it can have excess or insufficient. It has a lot of thermal energy or not much thermal energy. It has a lot of water or not much. Whoops. Um, it has a lot of vitamins and minerals or not much. And it has a lot of oxidative stress, so high energy short lived molecules that can do a lot of damage or not much, we can block those with multivitamins. So they, we could add noise, we could add light, we could add pollution, pathogens, social stress. Um, and they're all equally important. And if you're a psychologist, then you might want to substitute social into one of those. Um, but nevertheless, 
in every stressor we have too much and none. And in fact, the only place you can go, I think, and you have to go way deep into the universe to get away from all of those. Or you could just go to the dark side of the moon and you'd be pretty close. Um, but, but that's important, because we actually respond to all of those stresses. We need them all. So all of them, and this is another fundamental point, all of them are outside your body, but all of them are inside your body as well, and particularly in your cells. And only exercise generates all of them internally, not social stress internally. But um, Moreover, it's powerful, it's selective, it's selective in time, it's regulated. It's mostly within, but also outside cells. Um, so we, it activates multiple pathways, multiple sensors in cells, particularly in muscle during exercise and without feeding and after feeding and with heat and without and so forth. So we've got a huge number of pathways being activated by these stresses selectively. And that's what exercise is. For me, exercise is just this almighty complicated stressor. And if we want to really understand exercise, we have to delineate that down and figure out what each of those stresses does. And to what extent does it drive fatigue? To what, does what extent that actually obligatory in driving adaptation? And that's going to depend, of course, on the nature of the exercise and the nature of the individual and their fatigue state and their medications and their age and all sorts of things. And we consider all of those things in our research and we try and control for some of them, we manipulate them and we figure out how these things are being manipulated. So, for example, you can have enormous metabolic stress and oxidative stress. An untrained person walking up the stairs, whereas a trained person to get their cells into the same state and drive the same fatigue and drive adaptation, they might have to sprint up and down the stairs a few times. But as far as the cells are concerned, it's the same stress. Um, and that's important for determining safety, tolerance, adaptation. Um, and, and not only that, it's not only happening inside your cells, but more and more it's being realized the hundreds of molecules that are released out of cells during exercise and they communicate with neighboring cells, other organs. So the muscle talks to the liver, to fat tissue, to the brain by releasing hundreds of molecules that go and communicate elsewhere. Um, so exercise is kind of complicated. But it's also incredibly versatile and incredibly simple. Just do it. <laughs> um, but when you just do it, there's a lot going on. So um, what this, now I know that's a whole lot of background. But what that allows us to then understand is that exercise is inherently and difficult. It's difficult in environments that impose the same stresses. So if you exercise in the heat, the better the athlete, the more the heat you generate, because the more metabolism that goes on, the faster you go. So that's why athletes find hot environments hard, but they're fit. So they're used to dealing with heat from the inside, so they can also tolerate warm environments well. But you also set a world record in the marathon if you go to the opposite environment to exercise in, because it doesn't cost you so much physiology to be in that environment to sustain that level of exercise. So you save water and you save the cardiovascular strain, and that allows you to exercise harder, because they have a lot of downstream effects that cause early fatigue. But unfortunately, that environment has lack of oxygen and it has a lack of energy substrates and so forth. And that can compromise your exercise. So this is where exercise and environmental physiology very much cross over. So when we deal with the Olympics and firefighting and you know whether it's wildline firefighters or domestic firefighting, these are all kind of issues that we deal with, that we're thinking about. And whether we superimpose, so whether we train, we add the heat of the environment to the heat of our training to try and enhance our training adaptation, or we stand on a vibration board and try and add to the stress of that way through the vibrational physical stress. So these become really interesting areas to actually work in. Now, last bit of kind of intense stuff, hopefully. So I'm trying to front load some of the worst of it. Um, to stay alive and to thrive, 
you need to keep a bunch of things pretty constant. So that's the acidity or the alkalinity, the temperature, the glucose levels, the blood pressure, the, the cell volumes. There's lots of things that get detected and get kept pretty constant. For many of these things, if they get out of whack and exercise forces them all out of whack, you activate some sensor, some, some thing that will try and correct it. Sorry, it's not a sensor. The sensor detects it. Generally, an area in your brain will coordinate a lot of this stuff, and it will activate something like your sweating or vasodilation of your skin blood vessels. And they will ramp up their activity according to how bad this situation is getting. And they'll reach a peak, and that peaks usually because it's not how high the system could go. It's being competed against by some other system. Um, and at some point, the system gets so bad that it fails. Um, so we measure all of these things to try and characterize the person's tolerance and therefore their fitness, um, their safety <coughs> prospects and so forth. So for heat, if this was your body temperature going up where you release your vasoconstriction, you have another system that actively dilates blood vessels, you start sweating, but by far and away you change your behaviour. So if you're exercising, just reduce your intensity because you reduce your heat production. So the heat stress isn't so bad. But these occur acutely and chronically. Um, we could go to the other side, sorry. Um, so when we go cold, we actually have some decent response systems as well. But it's our behaviour by far and away. We're not actually very good in the cold physiologically. We rely entirely on our behaviour. Therefore, we hate the cold. And that's why we hate the cold. Because we rely on this to get us out of it or keep us safe. So by and large, people who are fit have better of all of these things. They start with a lower body temperature. They crank up their heat losses faster. They go to more powerful levels. They sustain it for longer. They go to higher temperatures before they fail. You could do that for their glucose control, their pH control, whatever. Um, so being fit truly is physiologically quite a complicated set of attributes that gives you a generalized stress tolerance. So you could go into a hot environment, you detect that environment and do something about it earlier, you can do it more powerfully, you can sustain that environment for longer, you can tolerate higher temperatures, for example, in a sauna before it fails, before you fail. Um, so being fit has quite a cool set of attributes that give you versatile stress tolerance. And we'll talk about some of those situations a bit later. But that's our physiology. But part of being fit also is having better behaviour. And ultimately, whether you're a phys ed group in a glacial stream where you're an athlete running a Hawaii Ironman, it's your behaviour that by far and away is the most important thing. Physiologically, we're actually relatively limited. Our behaviour keeps us out of trouble. But being an athlete, you have this competition between your behaviour and your physiology. You're pushing your physiology to the limit. The person who has the best physiology pushes it the most wins. Um, so I'll give you an example of how we tend to study this. So Gord came over, and this is one of the studies we did in Melbourne, where we put people in a big fridge for 45 minutes at 4 degrees, naked, semi-naked. And we either put hot packs or cold packs on their thighs and then got them to do some exercise. And it didn't actually make any difference whether they had cold packs or hot packs. But being in the fridge, compared with not being in the fridge for 45 minutes, when they got on the bike and did standardised exercise, there was a massive benefit to their cardiovascular system because it didn't have to serve the skin to offload the heat. And then what we typically do, so this is a typical experiment we do, we set people off at a standard fixed workload that we control so we can figure out what we've done to their physiology and what is driving it. Then we let them self-pace. And as soon as we let them go for it, they go 20% faster if they've been in the fridge than if they haven't. And what we see here is it just closes up the cardiovascular difference. So it's the cardiovascular benefit of being cold that gives them the better work tolerance. Um, so we're often marrying together the physiology and the behaviour, and I don't think exercise does this well enough where it looks at both sides of it. You know, 
commercial enterprises and things tend to look at just the behavior, like altitude training. An athlete believes it works, but it doesn't necessarily mean it did. They just feel like they can behave better. Whereas a physiologist would say, well, why does that work better? But we need to marry these two things together. Um, so why focus on exercise? Why extreme environments? And I, for me and for, for most academics, research, teaching, and service just rolls all together. Where does one start and where does the other one finish? And in fact, where do the contexts finish? So this is, we could be talking about health, which is our lived experience. We could be talking about sport and performance or survival. And for me, exercise isn't about whether you're working or playing or doing five sets of 10 reps or whatever. You know, these guys are walking. This is us Westerners walking across a bridge while this guy who's working is waiting for us at the other end. Um, fairly typical um, of Westerners. Um, but for me, they're both exercise. I'm not going to quibble about what's exercise, what's physical activity. You're just doing something that's exercise, as far as I'm concerned, for this. And of course, the context of disease and lifestyle as well. Um, and, and also, you know, our lifestyle goes against a lot of effort about whether you're working or it kills us. Um, and of course, there's knowledge. We can study exercise or extreme environments just to understand how we work. And the value of that shouldn't be underestimated. Um, and we get, and when I was writing, particularly this, this little piece, I was just typing up the slide. One of my students contacted me, and he, he, he sent me a link to this. And he said, one of his athletes asked him about it, and he's a coach, and does he think they should buy it? And I'll try and read it if I can, because you won't be able to. Experience, this is an ember wave bracelet. Experience thermal comfort on demand. Developed by MIT scientists, Emberwave lets you cool down when you're too hot and warm up when you're too cold. Emberwave is powered by patent-pending technology that uses cutting-edge th thermoelectrics and precisely engineered algorithms to produce maximally effective temperature, something or other. Waves. Waves. <laughs> Sorry, you can't. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Typical prof. Um, so yeah, you can read the rest of it. And, <laughs> and it costs quite a bit. So um, for me, I mean, that typifies westernization, really, doesn't it? They're impressive words. It's an association with STEM, quite deliberately, science, technology, engineering, and maths. At one level, you're achieving thermal comfort that seems worthy um, for the person on the planet, because you can personalize your comfort. So you don't need to change the thermostat. You just change that thing. Um, but provided, of course, you can't achieve that same goal by adjusting your clothing, for example, <laughs> a little bit cheaper, um, and so the myriad resources involved in the development and production and distribution of, of that device. And as importantly and as insidiously, it removes your basic stress exposure, which I actually think is the bigger issue there, and your behavioural responsibilities. So as we do these things and as we disempower people's experienced lives, um, we've got to wonder what we're, why we're doing it. And I could talk 45 minutes on any of those particular things, but we're not going to. Um, so the reason I raised that one is because this is actually what my PhD was on. It was on raising, evaluating the skin's role in thermal inputs. And it just didn't make any sense to me, that device, because... What I figured out in the PhD, and what was, that, I think, a pretty cool contribution, was if you heat or cool your limb extremities, it actually doesn't make any difference to how you feel. But if you heat or cool your face, it has a big effect. So if you're going to make one of those devices, pin it on your forehead. <laughs> um, and you'll be able to tell from this rack that I made for my PhD, I don't tend to endear comfort, I guess, in the experience <laughs> that we do. Um, and luck, I mean, they're friends at the time, and actually most, <laughs> most of them are still friends, which is pretty cool. Um, cold sensitivity. So what, we actually found some useful stuff, I think. Uh, we respond to the temperature and rate of cooling. We kind of already knew that. We confirmed it. But war if you're warm, you don't respond to the rate. You only respond to the temperature, if, if, unless it's particularly quick. And when the skin has more role as an input for determining our thermal behavior, which again is really important, 
more than our sweating, which is more than our skin blood flow. So they determine, determine, determine more by your brain temperature. And most importantly, we have these strong regional differences. So your hands and feet can detect the fact that something's cold, but it doesn't change how you feel. But if you do the same on your head, it can detect the cold as well, but it also changes how you feel. So that's what I mean. Make the device and put it on your head. But actually, there's some kind of bizarre situations here. And I just, I'm getting a bit slow, and I'm going to have to start reading some notes so I don't get... No, people, as I say, guaranteed I wouldn't get finished, and I do want to prove them wrong. <laughs> um, there's some really interesting situations, and I'll, I've got to tell you the context. We, it looks like we developed to be like this, because we are. Um, we're phenomenally good at getting rid of heat. So we stand up, and we're hairless, and we're completely covered in sweat glands. We have double sets of vasodilators all over our well, distributed around our skin. We only don't sweat thermally on our hands, so we can grip stuff. But it's, of course, when you grip stuff for a long time that you get sweaty palms, or some people get nervous sweaty palms. But by and large, we're just heat loss machines. But we need to be, because if we chase something, we produce twice as much heat as that thing, but we can still out thermoregulate it, which is, I think, remarkable. And that's our physiology. Our physiology for heat loss makes us truly unique in so many ways, the power and the complexity of it. But it's our behavior that's just so much more again, because we can just shoot it. So we don't even then need to run so far. Um, and we, you know, we have these other options. We could drive after it these days. Um, so w we really are remarkable. But as I say, we, it costs us twice as much heat to move as a quadruped that we're trying to chase and kill. And when we walk, it costs an enormous amount of energy because it's so inefficient to walk that fast. And what they think happened with Craig Barrett is he put ice in his cap. He's got his cap off there, but he's already overheated. And what we're wondering, and what Gordon and I were wondering, is did he fool himself? So an athlete, so sports science has to take responsibility for its interventions. And if you've got someone who's redlining it physiologically, be careful what you do with them. Um, whereas a, an, another aspect of my PhD was um, showing the distribution of sweating. And unfortunately, you don't sweat much off your legs. You only sweat like half as much as off the upper body, but you produce most of the heat out of your legs. Um, and you don't sweat that much, as I say, on the palms of your hands. So what this guy did, he's really heavy. He shouldn't have been able to win the Hawaii Ironman, but he did. And what he actually did with Lars Nebo, a very good thermal physiologist, he put gloves on his hands, and because in the Hawaii Ironman you're allowed to use the ice baths, he just kept filling his gloves up with ice. And because that doesn't change the, temperature, the perception of body temperature, and you've got a massive blood flow through your hands, it gave him a really good heat loss mechanism without affecting his thermoregulation. So you can manipulate these things however you want, but be careful sort of what you do. Here's a really bizarre situation as well, and it was really sad. This guy was winning the World Open Water Swimming Competition, and he died in the last race of heat stroke. And they thought the water was too hot. And until that time, they didn't know how hot's too hot to swim. So Carl's PhD, we actually got people to do 200 swims in the flume. And a lot of them were in water up to 33. The air temperature was 35. And we put solar lamps right above them. But we had to protect them so they didn't smash from the water and hit people. Um, and we tried to figure out how hot is too hot to swim. And even in 33 degrees, they didn't get into trouble. And here's the key. If you're swimming in 33 degrees and your core temperature goes up, you know it's gone up. And you, if you're swimming in 33 degrees, you get uncomfortable when your core temperature goes up. And that's great, because then you're not going to overheat, because you're going to behaviorally thermoregulate. So that's, we looked at all the thermoregulation and the stress hormones and the inflammatory mediators in the blood and all sorts of stuff. But ultimately, you want to know about this. You want to know whether the athlete knows of the situation they're in. And the reason we were most curious about that 
is that's 33 degrees. That's a skin temperature that this building's designed for. That keeps your skin at 33 degrees, which is optimal comfort. So we didn't know where the swimmers would be in danger because they were at a thermally comfortable skin temperature. And we actually used that as a research model to figure out that the, the brain is about four times more thermosensitive than the skin in driving the discomfort. And that's really important primary knowledge to work out as well. Um, uh, something I forgot to mention, of course, the better the athlete, the more they rely on evaporation. So if you're running through the air, you absolutely need evaporation. And this is why Tokyo is going to be such an interesting situation, because it's so humid. The faster athletes need evaporation more. The spectator doesn't need so much. You can't evaporate in, the in water. So that's the other reason we're curious about that. So anyway, these are the contexts we work in. So I'm going to have to move on a bit. Um, Summary one of three. <laughs> Humans detect and respond to a wide range of stresses. Well, you can probably read that faster than I can. So that's from within and without, uh, acute and chronic. The exercise and the environment share many stresses. That makes some environments hard and some easy to exercise in. Exercise is uniquely complex in its stresses, but it's all largely self-regulating. It relies on behavior. That's often most important acutely and chronically. Our heat defense is a uniquely powerful, elaborate, and complex, and science, technology, and engineering is amazing, but it also has major social and environmental responsibilities. So we'll move on to the second part. I ran this past my daughter the other day, and she got to the end, and she said, is there anything, like, um, positive in there? <laughs> <laughs> and I think it was in response to this slide. And what this slide is is a really cool finding from the Dunedin study. Well, it's cool, but it's a bit distressing as well. These were the mums and these were the dads of their sons and daughters. And if you look at their fitness as a late teenager, um, it's not looking good for the next generation. And this is kind of the line for independent living. And these are young people in their physiological prime. And every year you age, that's what happens to this measure of fitness. And this is an important prognostic indicator of your longevity. Because if you test somebody's aerobic fitness, you're testing all of their physiological systems at once. It's a snapshot on how good is their body, how resilient is it, how powerful is it, how much can they do. We know, and we've been doing these experiments and other people have as well, we can make people do sprint exercise and endurance exercise, and it doesn't actually make any difference. You get good fitness regardless of what type of exercise you do provided you're a responder. Some people get about 20%, some people get none. You can do the best exercise program that could be designed and you get no change in fitness. Doesn't mean the exercise isn't valuable. You could be getting other benefits like glucose control, bone density, antidepression, you know, lots of other effects, but don't expect it's necessarily gonna get fitter. Um, and the reason this is important is because unfit people have about 70% more chance of dying early, well, that they're a lot more likely to die early than people who are moderately fit. And people who are highly fit are less likely to die early, whether you're male or whether you're female. And we don't want to get too much into the detail of that, but basically the more you do, the better. Um, the first bit's the most important for longevity. Just get out and do something. But in terms of maximizing cardiac function, muscle function, brain function and things, and some disease avoidances, it looks like more is better. But for overall longevity, it's not the case. It's very much diminishing returns. Just go and do something. Um, now, quickly, why does exercise, for example, help the brain structure and function? And the reason for this slide is we were looking at whether high intensity exercise might optimize brain function. All I want to say about this is for the brain or many other organs, there's multiple ways exercise does it. It directly is activated through the brain and does things directly in the brain. Brain's controlled by blood flow. Blood flow, uh, you change the blood flow to the brain when you exercise depending how fit you are. Fitness changes your glucose and blood pressure control. Both of those things determine the long-term health for the brain. As I said before, exercise releases lots of chemicals out of muscle that can come around and affect brain structure and function. 
So when we think of which type of exercise is better or worse for the brain, well, high systolic blood pressure might not be that valuable during exercise, but maybe you release more myokines from muscle, and maybe that has a better effect. We just, we're not in a position to know which type of exercise might optimise certain outcomes and why. There's just so many levels at which exercise is having its effect. Here's something um, encouraging for us who are ageing. Um, this is our brain blood flow as we get older. It doesn't look great. It basically halves as you go through your adult lifespan. But it's higher if you're fitter. And more importantly, what Carissa's PhD showed is for young and old people, you improve the brain blood flow control, and that's the most important thing, the brain's ability to regulate its own blood supply. So she was the first, that was the first study to longitudinally show in humans that exercise training improves the brain's control of its own blood supply. Travis at the moment is going on and looking at combinations of stresses on the brain function <coughs> cognitively and, and vascularly. Lainey Shoemaker is going at the moment and we're looking at what is it in exercise that's, that's maybe underlying the cognitive improvements that we know we get in exercise. And, of course, Liana uh, was in the paper earlier this week with a study looking at the role of exercise in improving cognitive function. We talked before about the fact that exercise um, glucose control is one of those factors that's important for the brain and for many other organs as well. And we can be smart with exercise. If we time it just before our meals, for example, what Monique came up with was this notion of exercise snacking. And if you just do six one-minute bouts before each meal, it blunts your glucose levels. You want to keep your glucose levels down, and you want to keep them constant. So you want to keep them down here if you can. But these are in pre-diabetics. And if we just got them to do a little bit of exercise before every meal, compared with a 30-minute exercise before the dinner, you kept your blood glucose down, kept it more stable. That lasted also across the next day, and it dropped your blood pressure. So there are, you know, there's physiologically smart ways to think about how we might want to dose and time our exercise. I'm going to have to skip through a little bit. Um, so we've got 18 minutes. I think I'm allowed. Um, so basically, exercise I think is wonderful. Um, it, it's pluripotent against most non-communicable diseases. And most people with these die of a non-communicable disease. It impacts most of our system. It's a non-linear benefit dose, so you just have to do something. It's highly versatile, it has low risk, and it's free. Um, exercise is more than medicine, because it's good for our society and communities. It improves our connectedness, reduces crime, CO2 emissions, resource usage, traffic congestion, depending how we do it. This is increasingly how we're doing it. We're boxing it in space and time and the concept of what it is. And I think that's going to become problematic. It's useful, don't get me wrong, but we have to look at the consequences of that. Compared with how we used to exercise and how many populations do exercise. These are, we were walking up to Everest Base Camp and these kids were throwing snowballs at us over the top of the thing. And they just walked to school, which is another village somewhere else. Now, here's, here's another key point. Our environment, increasingly, our lifestyle, removes all stresses. And that's a problem, because we respond and adapt and detect all of those stresses. We don't detect their absence. It's insidious, it's chronic, and it removes our structure and function, and that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy because we lose our capacity then to respond, and we need to be in a benign environment. So that's what that slide says, so I'm not going to stop there. And, as importantly, that then means we would regard this as dangerous and this is not. And therefore, we have risk management. Well, they're my kids, so it doesn't matter. But if there, was, <laughs> if there were school kids, you would have a risk management strategy for that. In fact, you wouldn't do it, or well, your job would be on the line. Um, so I think maybe we need to recalibrate what we consider to be the locus of the risk. It's, it's easy to blame somebody for that. It's hard to blame somebody for the consequences of that. So maybe we just need to, to rethink that. 
Exercise has caused more than medicine for individuals and far now in terms of we learn and experience of ourselves and others. We appreciate the environment, we learn from the environment because unlike any structured environment, the environment is completely random. It's infinite. It's such a rich learning opportunity. And therefore we develop empathy for the environment. And here's just another little point to put in here is that we are complicitly potentiating our environmental stresses through our greenhouse gas emissions while, as I showed you before, becoming less able to tolerate them collectively and individually. And at some point, we're going to get a collision, a consequence of this. And we can foresee this. So there's a bit of a worry in phys ed that people are focusing too much on fitness. First of all, you have to learn how to move. And then you're going to want to move. These two scenes here, within about five kilometres of here, that one's not much further, and that could be your backyard. Just go and do something. <laughs> then, if you have that capability and that desire, then you're going to want to go somewhere a bit further afield, and that's all pretty local. Well, you need a car, but it's reasonably local. And you'd love that environment if you build up the experience to be in that environment. And these were just some snapshots taken over the last week. I was instructing on a phys ed camp in the hills, and um, it was, I'm completely shattered, actually, from it. But I, I mean, the feedback you get from these situations, they're truly transformative experiences for people. And when we think of what we're doing to the environment, the need to develop empathy and to be comfortable in that environment, uh, why wouldn't we? So we have to financially find a way, I think, to allow these experiences in our education. This is, a, this is a conference we held, and we took people over Mount Alfred on a day trip, and then we took a bunch of them away for the weekend. And you know, we, we can be doing that in New Zealand. We, we have such a unique environment, and they're such powerful experiences for people. And they're great academic experiences as well, actually. So we should and we can prioritise an active lifestyle. We can't afford not to. Um, we can meet half of the WHO's sustainable policy framework uh, development things. We have legislated opportunity for Māori perspectives, and that's, that's key. We have an astounding uh, natural environment with benign climate and fauna. Well, climate maybe. <laughs> we have a population that's relatively small, educated, egalitarian, and protected against big pharma. I mean, if New Zealand can't do it, who can? Cripes. So, summary two. Exercise and fitness are important, but not at the expense of the environment. They're in, in, immensely complex, and they are misunderstood, insufficiently understood, but highly versatile and accessible. Exercise is powerful medicine, but it's more than just medicine. We structurally suppress it by modernity, and that's, I think, through STEM and consumerism, but that also allows us to get out of it and it provides rich opportunities for development. Now, I'm allowed, I think, 11 minutes, 10 minutes. <laughs> Sorry, I'm at 39. Um, here's just some things I just want to touch on, cross-adaptation and then a couple of different environments. So we've talked about this, but we can cross-adapt between different stresses. So if you can't go to, to a high altitude, maybe you can use heat as a stressor because they actually use a lot of the same cytoprotective pathways that protect cells. So maybe we can chronically expose to this and protect against that. If we're going in for surgery and we know this, the surgery itself, the anesthesia, and then the bed rest after it to be deconditioning, one's stressful, one's deconditioning. So we can use stresses. And if people are heavily osteoarthritic or whatever and they can't exercise, use another stressor that was within exercise. So there's all of these opportunities to cross-adapt and cross-tolerate, and, and this is an amazing future. Uh, it's a highly exciting area. So aerobic fitness protects you against many things, and here's an example. We dehydrated untrained people and trained people, and we got them to exercise, and this is how fast their heart rate drifted up in exercise. If they were untrained and they were well hydrated, they had less drift than if they were dehydrated. But if you're trained, you don't get heart rate drift so much, and it doesn't make any difference if you're hypohydrated. 
So fitness provides cross-tolerance protection against some of these individual stresses. Um, heating with or instead of exercise, for who should we actually do that? Because, of course, exercise has a lot of heat, so just do the exercise. But maybe we can supplement it for athletes to improve their fitness. Um, maybe other people might want to do it. You know, hot yoga change, decrease the dose of exercise and increase the heat. So you're substituting one for another, and it's simply another way to achieve a similar outcome. Um, in this regard, sauna bathing by the Finns, if they sauna bathe four to seven times a week compared with only once a week, they're basically halving their mortality risk in any given follow-up period. They're pretty major effects of heat. Admittedly, they don't know whether that's necessarily the sauna or the plunge pooling or the cold associated with it. Not competitively. This guy actually died. That was the world sauna bathing champ. So if you do something and you, you ignore your behavior, what do you get? <laughs> Um, we don't think heat's particularly useful in training to enhance fitness. So Anthony trained one leg hot and one leg cold for endurance, for strength training. He didn't get more muscle mass. So you see the big distribution of people's in hypertrophy when they train. He didn't get a difference between the two. So we didn't get a benefit for the muscle development. The strength developments weren't different between whether you know, trained leg hot or not in terms of the strength capacities. So we don't advocate using heat to try and enhance performance. We don't advocate altitude either. Uh, I just want to make a quick comment about we can add stresses together. So if you do upright exercise, even for people who are trained, the next day you have more blood volume. If you now do that exercise in the heat, the next day you have even more blood volume. And if you do exercise in the heat and you dehydrate, the next day you have even more blood volume. So if you randomize the order that people do this. And what allowed that was the fact that you have more of a hormone that, serves, that conserves fluid. So the hotter people got, the more they had this hormone and the more that increased their blood volume. So we can selectively add these stresses onto each other. It doesn't mean you should train hot in the heat every day. It just means it's a possibility, and these stresses combine with each other. And in fact, and some of you may not be aware of this, I mean, athletes have about up to 50% more blood in their bodies per kilogram than non-athletes. And more blood is good. And um, you can have a lot more blood and a lot lower blood pressure at the same time because your vessels are more compliant and they hold more blood. So that's what happened. They had more blood and they had lower blood pressure, both great outcomes. As I say, doesn't mean we should dehydrate every day, but it doesn't mean we shouldn't. We actually train people in the heat, and we tested this question for the first time because they thought humans can't adapt to dehydration, and we can't. If we go in the heat every day, on the 50th day, we need just as much water as we did on the first day. And therefore, heat. Heat's often, I mean, sorry, hypohydration, dehydration is often frowned upon. But we ask the question, well, what if you, you, can you adapt through dehydration? Not to dehydration, but through it. Can you use it as a supplemental stressor? So we adapted people in the heat with them without being dehydrated. And of course, they improved in a whole lot of things. But this is whether they improved more with the dehydration than with the eu-hydration every day. And, and at the very least, what we can say is dehydration didn't impair adaptation. If anything, for several things, it possibly enhanced it. But again, we're not prepared to say that people should dehydrate every day. But certainly, we have no evidence that it impairs dehydration. And this is another big area that should be researched. So. I think this is a phenomenally exciting area. So stress conditioning has enormous potential. We can use environmental or artificial stresses with or without exercise, particularly those who can't exercise or find it uncomfortable or have physical barriers or whatever. We can use it to provide cross-tolerance to a novel stressor. So we can precondition before removing the stress, such as immobilization, or before a novel stress, such as surgery, heat waves, or deployment to a stressful environment. It's relevant mostly for those who can't exercise, and we can use it to improve our knowledge of the mechanisms in performance, health, and disease. But it's early days, and we wouldn't advocate that athletes do it. Athletes should just train. 
Um, and combining stresses, I showed you an example where it worked, but there's no, hardly anyone's looked at it in a training capacity, but no one's yet shown that if you use like heat and hypoxia or altitude and add them together, that a person gets fitter, they don't. The heat wins, the altitude doesn't. Um, so it's appealing to add stresses together for conditioning, but no one's yet shown it to be useful. Right, the final thing, I'm just going to quickly move through. Um, we've come to explore the boundaries of human we, We've been doing adventure racing for a while. What are the mines? They have come for the world's toughest endurance competition. And we wondered how damaging this sort of thing was. Covering over 300 miles, testing themselves against the sheer mountain peaks. Gaping ice crevasses and freezing rivers. One of the profs that I was working Traveling with in Wollongong, he thought we were irresponsible to do this, and yet he does nothing for a week. And we exercise continuously for a week. And I, don't, I still don't know which of those is more damaging. Um, we don't find any, we've done this with an adventure race around here, and we don't find anything that's significantly impaired during these week-long exercise bouts. Um, so this is why we got in to study it. Um, and we tested cognition and blood glucose and strength and power and endurance and various things, and nothing was really that affected. What goes on when you do really long exercises, you just get centrally fatigued, and that just stops everything from getting overexerted. The heart gets a little bit affected for a short time, but... You know. <laughs> but, and the other thing is, we don't know whether we lose memory capacity in older age, but the reality is, I remember every day of every single adventure race for the last 28 years. I don't remember much else. <laughs> so I don't, I don't even care if it's real. Um, at least you have a memory of something. And just another point that we think we, um, we, think we have good endurance when we go into these 500 kilometer races. These guys fly halfway around the world and they don't even have a compass and they don't just sleep, just stop to sleep and they don't stop to feed. These guys, we, I mean, we train for this. Some people train for this for months. Um, they get out of their nest for the very first flight and they fly 12,000 kilometres. Like, and they don't, have a, they don't know where they're going either. Cold, so just quick comment on cold. I actually think Dunedin Flats are an amazing model to study cook cold, <laughs> particularly people coming from the tropics, because humans just don't normally go into cold chronically, but you do. It's like a rite of passage if you go into a student flat. And I would love to study long-term effects of people coming from tropical places into Dunedin Flats. <laughs> One interesting issue is we don't, it's now known, humans don't adapt to cold in terms of severe cold, we actually cool faster. So if we get put in cold water, and this was um, Stan, our best man and good mate through uni, so we put people in cold water and they just become hypothermic. And if you do that every day, they actually cool faster. They don't defend, they don't adapt, they habituate. So they cease responding. The Aboriginal do it as well at night. They cool down and they just warm up the next day. Um, Um, so there's, there's large individual differences, but we don't, we don't adapt. This, I think, is a really, whoops. This is a really cool cold environment. Wet, wind and cold together intermittently. I mean, it doesn't get colder than that. Um, people study what happens when you go into cold, and this is the one thing that responds really well, the cold shock. The cold shock is actually deadly. The, the strong cardiorespiratory response to cooling. And when you put people in the cold, this is typically how people do get into the cold. In New Zealand, they just jump in because most of the water's cold. When you study it in research and you lower people into the cold, their brain blood flow goes down to critical levels. And that's what's thought to be the effect of cold cooling. So what Chris Button did was he dropped people into the flume in the cold water. And when you do that, and people suddenly go into the cold water and they have to start moving, 
their brain blood flow goes straight back up. So you actually get a completely different answer depending how you do your research. So if we put it into these more practical contexts, we're better off. I'm going to stop there. So I was just going to make talk one just, just altitude, which I'm not going to. And I just want to make the comment, the same thing seems to happen with the brain blood flow. You habituate, you don't adapt to high altitude. You have a terrible night for your brain. It goes, its blood flows up and down all the time. You stop breathing, you know, 60 times an hour, 100 times an hour. And you think you're better off after two weeks. You're not. You just don't know that it's still happening. <laughs> so in many ways, when we go to high altitude, we think we're adapting. And in some ways, we are. But in some important ways, we're not. We're simply habituating. Um, You were right, I didn't make it. <laughs> so thank you very much for listening and sorry to be time wise up there. So thank you. Studies that you do. <laughs> I've, yeah, I've run out of friends. <laughs> Jim, hearty congratulations on your well deserved promotion to professor. And thank you for your uh, thoughtful and evocative and insightful inaugural professorial lecture. And I know that we've all profited from your talk tonight. Over 50 years ago, Philip Smithles, the founder of the School of Physical Education, published the essential traits of a professor. In exploring exercise, the environment, and their extremes, Jim captured these traits, which include a passionate interest in an intellectual area of inquiry, intellectual dynamism based on a questioning mind, an awareness of public issues, and an ability to communicate to different audiences. In this evening's lecture, we saw Jim's passion shine through as he engaged with the effects of internal and external stresses on physiological systems. Assumptions and arguments about the human body and its capacity for physical stressing reveal Jim's intellectual dynamism. And a willingness to question popular beliefs was apparent in Jim's conceptualisation of the physiologically extreme modern built environment. Jim's identification of the paradox of the modern built environment is an important contribution to contemporary debates concerning strategies to improve public health. On the one hand, the modern built environment assists our biological need to conserve energy. On the other hand, the lack of useful transient stresses facilitates the decay of physiological structures and functions. In this paradox resides a warning to public policy makers of the unintended consequences of artificially compartmentalising physical stresses in the built environment. Jim's incorporation of behaviour and by extension culture, society and politics into the exercise and physiology equation illustrates his willingness to communicate and engage with diverse audiences. Jim has also a long, has long displayed his communication skills in media commentaries concerning human performance and physiology. Smills referred to the importance of teaching and mentoring in the role of the professor. And Jim has excelled on this front. He has supervised more than two scores of PhD and master's students. And many of his students have established careers in teaching and researching physiology. Some of them have journeyed from afar to be here today. The Otago University Students Association has awarded Jim Supervisor of the Year and observing the interaction between Jim and his students, one is struck by the collective excitement they generate in their search for understanding. 
Lastly, Smithles noted that professors must have the respect of their peers. And Jim has clearly won this respect, as is evident in the large number of citations of his research, his research grants, and his success in PBRF. Jim, your peers, colleagues, and students in the school wish you all the best for your professorial career. We know that you will continue to ask deep and difficult questions about physiology, human performance, physical activity, and well-being, and that you will continue to lead the search for fresh and creative answers. Finally, your colleagues in the School of Physical Education, Sport and Exercise Science, and the University of Otago look forward to many more years of the service and collegiality that you have given so willingly, generously, and without a second at this stage, Jim, we have a little uh, gift for you. Thanks, Thanks. <laughs>